uh, the time and I, uh, we were at uh, a very good place musically. And we were kicked out by the Royal Pump, Pump, whatever, of Prince. Well, yeah, Jimmy and Terry, they, they're my brothers, and they know yeah. I got much love for them, but... Um, he didn't want us to be doing other acts because, basically, the time was supposed to be paying our bills. Right. Which it wasn't, but hey, who cares? Uh, Sunset Sound, uh, right up the road here on Sunset, and uh, we were cutting Ice Cream Castles. Worked on the kid in LA with, with Morris on drums, especially Prince and Morris together. It was purely mad. Prince was like, Yeah, that's what I'm talking about right there. That's, that's, this is what I'm talking about. So then we. That song came together, a bass line submitted from Jesse Johnson really came, came up with the bass line. And Prince just took that ball and ran with it. Yeah, and, and you know, Jungle Love sounded like a hit to me. But Jungle Love, if you ever hear his version, I mean, he, it was the same song, but if you ever hear his vocal, he put his foot in it. <laughs> and Morris did a great job of Prince. If you heard Prince wrote that melody and the lyrics and all But it's just the whole twist. He you know, dude could sing when he wanted to. and Because that was the three amigos right there, Morris, Prince, and I. It's like you, it was, it, you... You saw one, you saw the three of us. There was a period where you never saw, and there was other reasons, personal reasons, why it was just ended up being just Prince and I all the time. Uh, contrary to rumors, we're, we're all real tight still. It was a business thing. We're best of friends now. That's right, Prince, we love you, man. Yeah. I wanted to chronicle that, uh, that vibe. Of I mean, we weren't that competitive off stage, but as far as performing was, we were. So I think that the movie hits on that a little bit. Once he realized that he had created this Frankenstein monster, then, you know, that's when the tension came. The whole Frankenstein's monsters of, of the time in Vanity Six, he created it like a Motown review. To have all these people wear what you want and do what you want and play what you want was a testament to his ability to control a lot of people, as we know. The time was comic relief for him. Whether they felt the same or not, I don't know, but we were all kind of creations in this play. This is a big movie. One of the first things I said when I told the story to Prince and he said, we're doing it. Regardless of what the budget, the budget can be five cents or 500, it doesn't matter. Whatever the budget is, it's a big movie within that. And every moment, every scene, Every visual, every choice we make has to be on the side of how big can we make it and what, what is the spectacle. That's how I just approached everything. I'm competitive. Prince is a super competitive individual, so we were always cool until we started touring. There was a competitiveness that existed from when they were young kids. But I also really think that Prince empowered Morris's character and really helped open him up and finding that Sagittarian ego. Morris is a real sweetheart, but he has the capacity to be a big personality when he's funny and when he really is just himself. He's funny. Bobby Z's first cousin is my brother-in-law, Stuart Pastor. He calls me on the phone and says, you have an audition with the time. So I go in the next day to this warehouse on Highway 7, walk in, go in, and I start playing the songs. I you know, get familiar with the instruments. Jesse was running the show back in those days. Morris was nowhere to be found. Got back home, got a call back, go back the next day, and Prince is sitting there this time. I'm like, ooh, what's going on here? Prince came up to me and he did the whole wreck a stove thing. He wrote down the words, wreck a stove, right? And then he said, read it. I'm like, I don't know, wreck a stove. <laughs> Come on, read it again. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Say it again. Wreck a stove. If you wanted to buy a Sam Cook Abbott, where would you go? Wreck a stove. He laughed and I laughed. And that, was his, that was his icebreaker with me. It was really cool. That it was his way of welcoming into the into the band. My relationship was with Morris, and there really was none. His best friends were just fired. He's pissed off. You know, he didn't want to deal with these people who were taking the place of his brothers. The new guys. Some of them, you know, never mind. You know, so he really wasn't around. He wasn't present. Jesse ran the show. Jesse helped recruit Martin Cardenas, who I still say to this day, never should have been in the time. He never should have been. I quit, and then, like I said, I have my first child, so I came back. We got a Paul Peterson. Paul was 18 years old. He went behind the ears and everything, and Jesse rode him like a like a horse and stuff, but he was a great kid. I mean, he's 18 years old, multi-talented. Jesse took a page out of the book of print. He was super, super, super demanding. We went back into heavy rehearsal mode because you had to rehearse that version of the band. 
had to be, get ready to, for Purple Rain and stuff. So we was into those eight and ten hour rehearsal days every day. We got it going, you know, we got it back, you know, where so at least when we, you know, we did the movie and stuff, we were prepared. We're just doing business as usual, rec recording songs and doing shows. Prince comes up and he's like, we're going to do a movie. Okay. <laughs> I never done a movie before, so and you know he used to tell us that he had dreams about the movie. And, you know that was when we were the first tours, the controversy in 1999 tour. That's his whole thing. He was obsessed, with, like I'm. We're gonna do a movie about this. He could see this. He, he could see all this stuff, you know. And I wasn't sure, you know. I was just like, I'm just happy to be in this. And we're big all around the country, and everybody adores us. But as far as the movies, that was a whole totally different thing. Just being on the big screen and being a snotty nosed kid from the north side, you know. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to be on the big screen? Oh, no, that's not going to happen. Prince empowered Morris's character and really helped open him up. You know, next thing you know, he's got us doing stupid in my book, you know, like going to dance classes and, and going to uh, acting lessons and, and all of this stuff, you know. And, um, you know, it still didn't seem like it was going to be a reality necessary, necessarily because, you know, we were just, you know, doing all this stuff. But we started doing casting calls. Then it started to come together. Director comes to town and the script shows up and uh, it's starting to look like, you know, we're really going to do this. That was one of the most honest or innocent efforts because, in my opinion, we didn't know what we were doing. The director uh, showed us the script. He sat me and Jerome down. Line for line, we went through the script and he said, OK, this is what the script says. What would you guys say? And so we basically rewrote all of our parts. I really wanted to chronicle the life I was living at the time. My love of rock music and living in Minneapolis, a lot of great talent, and Morris Day's performance, he was incredible in it. The character that you see of Morris was an alter ego of Prince. How that developed, however, that character came from Morris. It, it was, it was a, a, a little of both. It was created, and then it was, you know, also uh, a lot of the antics was, like I said, stuff we do when the tape wasn't running, and stuff we'd say, and it kind of we talk when the tape wasn't running, but then we decided to start doing that when the tape was running. And then, you know, we just started getting crazy with it, you know, and when we started having hit records, then we started getting cocky. So <laughs> it just grew and it grew and grew, you know, it's like, oh, people are digging it. So now we're really going to start cutting up, you know, so it was one of those kind of things. I mean, by then we were out of control, you know, it's like um, you start laughing and doing your, your thing. And like I said, we brought it from behind the scenes to the forefront. The guide vocals on those time tracks, the mannerisms were the mannerisms that, that Morris used, but Morris added his own spin to that. That goes back to the history of what I was talking about. There's a lot of stuff that from childhood with Prince. Prince started with Andre Simone, Morris Day, on the north side of Minneapolis in a band called Champagne. By the time he got the deal right. in, out here with Warner Brothers, he left a lot of stuff behind, but went back and got him later. When he got people, it was a mixed bag of emotion. Purple Rain was taking chunks of our lives and then inserting them into a film. In the north side of Minneapolis was Flight Time, which was Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, Alexander O'Neill, all these characters were alive and roaming the streets of Minneapolis. He'd already been threatened about bringing uh, girls in his dad's house. So, you know, he and I had these uh, girlfriends who were close friends. You know, back in the day, you, you kind of say you're sleeping over somebody's house, but you, um, <laughs> you're somewhere else doing something else, you know. So we were hanging out, doing the sleepovers with these girls and stuff. And so one day he sneaks the girl up to his room, pulls the mattress off the bed and throws it on the floor so there ain't no noise and squeaking going on. And uh, John found out about it. I was there with him when it happened. He came back, we came in, said hello to John and everything, and he didn't say nothing. He just looked at Prince and said, put your key on the table. And that was it. He didn't really say anything. He knew that that meant he was out. Okay, so you know, Prince got kicked out. I used to go to McDonald's there. I didn't have any money, but I used to just stand by there and just smell stuff. Here's this phone booth. I called my dad. I he kicked me out and begged him to take me back. I said no, so I called my sister in New York and asked her to ask me, and she did. She said, all right, all you have to do is call him and tell him you're sorry and really mean it, and he'll take you back. So I did, and he said no, and just sat there for about two hours. Once I made it, once I got over, poverty makes a lot of people angry. You know, once I was eating every day, 
got to be emotional as a person. I was insecure. I would attack anybody. Next thing I knew, he was taking up residence at Andre's house uh, in the basement. That's really like Prince's personality, the same uh, thing. In some respects. He was a very strict disciplinarian, but uh, all fathers were. Uh, and he said it. He meant it. There was no questioning it. And uh, that was it, man. <laughs> uh, I, I think it probably helped me to look inside to know that I had to do for self. He was a man of few words. He would say something, and he meant it. And that's just how John was. I, I have a way of being very stern, but I always find the irony in it, and I always make it funny. I make it funny for myself and the person. So he said, I'm going to take your songs from the movie and put them on your own record, and I will have the soundtrack out. Because everything was so strategic with this dude. You know, he just always thinking. I knew that it was somehow cutting me out of something. <laughs> when he's like, I'm not sharing the movie money with you. I think 99 was, was setting us up for Purple Rain. I know it did. I know the money we made for it. <laughs> Finance Purple Rain, but I think that was setting us up to do that. That's when he really started thinking big. He started thinking movies, and he, he knew he had the pop on us now. We, if we was going to make a move, this was the time to do it. Prince and myself were starting to kind of separate a little bit. You know, I was kind of doing my own thing. He was really engulfed in whatever his vision was with, with the movie and with the music. Uh, he did his scenes on different days than I would do mine unless we had scenes together. And so I would have to say that Purple Rain was really kind of when we started to like distance ourselves. The movie, movie is more complex, but to me it's just a larger version of an album. There was no movie out like that at the time. That's what I tend to do in all the things that I do. Is uh, the, the idea with art and ins inspiration is to try to let it grow and, and move forward. If there's stagnation, you can always come with something and cut through the maze. So we ought to have like a signal, a password. Things were moving so fast. We got lights all around us. We got people running up to us. Make putting makeup on it's on us. paper, if you just try and read something like that back and forth with another actor, uh, it's questionable how it's going to come out. Okay, what's the password? You got it. Got what? The password. And this is me and Morris's first time doing a film. But once we put it up on his feet and we were there in the moment. Uh, we rehearsed it with Don Renee. We rehearsed this scene probably two or three times. And then they put us on camera. Password is what? Exactly. Password is exactly? No, it's... Hold it, hold it. Slow down. Yeah, I felt it, you know, when we did that scene, because that scene was a difficult scene on paper. I was teetering on not knowing what I was doing. <laughs> I was confused. <laughs> the babe walks in. You see her. I see her. You come get me. I come get you. And I probably have a couple of sexes on standby. So you glide by me and you say what? Okay. It was going to take some timing and, you know, a little bit of magic to make it happen. The password is okay? As far as I'm concerned. Damn it, say the password. What? Say the password, onion head. The password is what? And each time we nailed it, man. We did that in two takes. <laughs> That's what I'm asking you. It's the password. The password is it? The password is what? It. You just said so. The password isn't it. The password is what? Got it. I got it. Right. It or right. <sighs> what? I was feeling real good about that. And we got through it and we did it easily. We did it a couple times and each time they were like, you know, we could just stop right now, but let's do another one. Jerome Benton, I'm real proud of him. He takes direction well. It was an innocent success. <laughs> <laughs> I was young. This is all new to me. All new to me. You know, and Albert Magnoli, he had the patience with us. What the f wrong with you, kid? Billy Sparks, the club owner from Purple Rain, Billy is just like he is in the movie. Laugh loud, talk loud, jolly. His crew was doing transportation. These are all some funny brothers. The van is full of smoke. And so we'd be laughing and cracking jokes. We would do that all the way to the movie and then uh, go in and recreate that. It was on the set of uh, Purple Rain. Morris was held. He wasn't late. But when you first walk into First Avenue, you know, you can either go that way. Mm -hmm. If you go this way, there's a stairway full of extras. And Prince was used to saying stuff to him, and Morris never would say and anything. Morris finally showed up. Prince walked up to him. And Prince got in his face. This morning, he, he wasn't that one.
And I only seen them about get ready to knock up one time. And I was just so happy. Like, oh, I'm going to fight. Bean got in the middle. Because y'all don't even know, man. Y'all don't even know, man. He, we would be on the set every morning at 5.30, but we wasn't shooting. No, it wasn't no hurry up and wait. Just didn't want us to be doing anything else. So you'd be on the set every day, full makeup, dress, <laughs> and ain't shooting or nothing. Just, had, just so he would know. Where, uh, where's Jesse? I know where he's over there. Okay. Again, you know what he, he knew what he was doing. So one day we were in the dressing room. And Morse finally showed up, and Prince got in his face. This morning, he, he wasn't that one, because he walked up to him, man, you know you're late. And the thing about it, he's doing this, man, you know you're late. <laughs> <laughs> and Morse is like, mother. You know, and Morse shut these. And I was wow. like, yeah, it's about no, like, time around <laughs> this moment. And inside, I'm like, yeah, she'll whoop his ass, you know? But I'm thinking, if we do that, I know Prince, we're done. We're going to be done totally. So I grabbed more. And Bean jumped in. Yo, keep your friends, yo. Man, get show us off the way. Let T tie this shit out. And pulling back, the big chick grabbed Prince. So a lot of cussing going back and forth. Morris is like, mama, hi, blah, 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 blah. And what the fuck? Blah, 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 blah. But, uh, oh, you know, no, Morris also know he needed to do this movie. It's like I know we needed to do it. I paid attention because they were friends of mine. Prince and Morris Day took me lingerie shopping, and I lived to tell the story. Oh my God, I could only, it was brutal, man. Just imagine that. Everything I tried on and come out in there are like, uh, big white girl legs. Uh, I don't know what they were saying. And I was just like mortified. And But uh, on the professional level where I was existing, it didn't, it was more just like noise. It was like, you know, I don't know what you guys are doing. You know, I'm busy. <laughs> like, uh, sort it out. Come on. You know, I didn't, didn't like it. I didn't like that kind of stress. You know, Finally, Prince got pissed. That was the last nail in the coffin as far as Morris was concerned. And of course, he went along with the program and did Purple Rain with the new band. But as soon as the film was in the can, they were done. It was all put together. It was flowing. You know, I was looking like a real actor up there, and um, it was it was exciting. Morris Day and the Time, they've been rivals of mine since 1982. They're not so friendly rivals. Uh, you got to understand that, I, that in the Time record, I think I played on one track, and it was the live track. So than that, that was all Prince and Jesse and Morris and whomever else. I play, I'm on the bird. Because, you know, and that's, I'm going to tell you a little story about that, too, because me and Morris, you know, our conversations with Prince, we wanted to put, there's a studio version of the bird that's funky as hell. Uh, but Prince didn't want that. He wanted the version out of First Avenue. So that's why the live version is on there and stuff. And he took it, went and doctored it up and, you know, did a few overdubs and everything. But he left it pretty much how it was with that night we played it at First Avenue. And then he put the, the performance from Jungle Love, he put that in the actual movie of us playing, you know, the, actually playing Jungle Love from First Avenue. So... So yeah, that's how I ended up on there. They did one show with that unit, the Purple Rain version of the time at First Avenue to basically introduce the band. I, I questioned it. You know, uh, to me, that was really the beginning of the end. The bird was supposed to be on the album. And we had a studio version of that song. Like, bring the house lights up. I like it like that. The studio version was super funky, clean, and it was hard hitting. Prince said, you know what? <laughs> He said, we're gonna do the bird live. He said, you guys are gonna record the song live in First Avenue, and we're gonna use that version on the album. This is my show. We're gonna take up a collection, you know, like they do in church. I'm gonna get to how many months I was in the band before we did our first gig, but we, we played at First Avenue once when I was in the band. Y'all had to excuse me. I was gonna mention this earlier, but I forgot. I'm not above that. Now, as we all know, Brother Prince played here a week or two ago, and from what they tell me, he charged $25 a head. I don't know about you, but I stayed home that night. That's just a little steep. Girl, just give it till it hurts, you know what I'm saying? And that was recorded for in the truck in the back of First Avenue for Purple Rain. All right, fellas, that's that was the end of that. So we filmed the movie and the Morris was gone. We got a show to do and we realize that. Anybody see Jerome, if they do, you know, send him back up to the stage. I know you did like I would do if I was in your position. Prince, are you out there? Did you give? 
You took? Did you give? You took? Did you give all that? Yeah, I remember him because he was, you know, talking stuff at, at the end of that thing. I think he kind of liked that rivalry aspect of it. I mean, God, they had it for forever growing up. Why wouldn't they keep that going? I think it was a... Uh, I think those guys had a special brotherly relationship that, that was built on competition. And I knew that, you know, they were making digs at each other, but, you know, that wasn't my, my dig to make. So we tried to make that work, but Morris was definitely not into it. Morris, like, disappeared. Couldn't find me for a long time because he didn't want to be a part of it anymore. So when I knew he was out, then I left. Make. The end of that show, Morris stormed off the stage. Everybody else went to the dressing room to open up a bottle of beer, whatever. Hey, good show. Morris didn't take his coat off, didn't stop and say a word to the band. He walked down the steps. And I went out the back door. Through that room, into his car. My Porsche. And left. And that was it. That was it. After we shot the uh, scenes, and that was the last time anybody saw me until I resurfaced uh, in California. I don't think in terms of fighting. I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't think that you win anything by fighting. I'm the type of person that likes to look at things for exactly the way they are. No, no one knows what the outcome is going to be once it gets into the main, once it goes out the mm -hmm. door and into a theater. I expected it. I, I, I think because there was, like I said, there was nothing out like it at the time. And Morris Dade, he was incredible in it. You know, it takes a lot of work to, uh, to do a film. Like I said, I wasn't a part of the dailies and the editing and all of that stuff. So shortly after the movie, uh, we shot some scenes in um, downtown L.A. We just had some fill-in shots to do. It felt great. Um, Jungle Love was on the radio so much, man. I think every station... You know, I turn, you know, I would hear it, and I turn to another station because maybe I didn't want to hear it. And guess what? It was on. It was just the rotation was incredible. So that was it for me. This is it. I'm in LA. I'm staying. So I was basically out of the band. In 84 at the Chinese Day Man's Theater. The yeah, the premiere. People were going crazy in the red carpet. I was like, oh, wait a minute. It was blowing up. What time is it, it was just a whole nother level of intensity. Yeah, right. It's a different shit going on here, yeah. you know. So that was Al Magnolia's story. We used parts from my past and my present life to make the story pop. But it was a story. You know what? It was real. Um, even though it was in the movie at the time, at times I was able to tap into some real emotions because there was some of that stuff really going on. So um, it was real, just as much as it was. Um, I feel you know, the same Hollywood. way, but he just doesn't talk to anybody. Later, you go home and watch this. We're going to be covering the party live. Have a good time Okay, tonight. folks, let's meet Mr. Morris Day. Morris. Uh, now, now, tell me about the time. You, are you still with the time? Well, this is our last record together, and uh, after this, it's going to be the Morris Day show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I've got big-headed, you know what I mean? Yeah. When Morris wasn't around, he, he didn't have to come to rehearsals. If he knew what ideas or how arrangements he wanted to add or whatever or not, I was the guy that, and I was never officially the guy that runs this. I was never that. I don't necessarily remember any conversation or, nor, or was I privy to any conversation about the time continuing with Jesse being the front man. They may have had that conversation. No, I, when I left, I left. Never, because the time was his thing. It was his baby. To this day, he'll tell you, I, I have major respect for hierarchy, but I respect him greatly. It's his thing, and I never step on anybody's toes during that thing. The prince came to us in this little warehouse that uh, was in Eden uh, Prairie. And he said, well, Morris is gone. Jesse's gone. Who wants to stay? We're going to do a new band, and you're going to be the lead singer. And he pointed at me. I think at that point of time, everybody wanted to sign someone from Minneapolis. So I'm sure there was a few more zeros attached to Jesse's offer than Prince was going to offer him. I signed as a production company, not as Jesse Johnson. So that's why I could go. I, if you look at that period, I'm on all kinds of stuff, doing everything everywhere. John McClain was my a &R guy, and, and, and um, he signed me. Mm -hmm. so I, the only artist I think I, he'd signed at that point in time. But um, we never reaped the Purple Rain right. yeah. thing. And because we were supposed to go on tour, when I signed my record deal, very few, if anybody, only John McClain knows and know this and Prince. But when I signed to AM Records, I signed 
the deal, but I didn't have to do a record for a year. It was going to be our first time out without Prince. It was going to be on our own merit. So that was the whole thing. We were never, ever, ever planned. Prince was, you kidding me? Prince was so sick of us putting our foot in his ass after the 1999 tour. He oh. wasn't taking us in the backyard. When Jesse did um, Fast Girls and that, we just thought, wow, okay, that's more... She's got like a little attitude to her because we knew young she had an attitude because when she was doing the whole Mae West thing. Um, so we knew she was cool. She was big fans at the time. She mm -hmm. sat front row when we played Long Beach when we couldn't play the forum and played Long Beach. She sat front row with her mom and she came back after and met us and stuff. She was so sweet and all that. So anyway, so we knew her already. We felt like we already kind of had a little bit of a relationship with her. Well, we only had um, actually one meeting with Joe where he told us... Uh, you guys are from Minneapolis. And we said, yeah. And he said, Prince is from Minneapolis. And we said, yeah. And he goes, don't make my don't daughter, have my daughter sound, sound like, like Prince. Prince. She came to Minneapolis alone with a girlfriend. Ordinarily, someone would just tell her what to do. We were just hanging. There was no agenda at all. Once she figured out that she could just be whatever she wanted to be, it was a breeze from there on. I mean, then she jumped right in both feet. She'd come up with ideas. we try things with her, along with her. So we would bounce things off of each other. The process was just seamless that way. Nasty is a good example of what you were talking about. When we did the track to Nasty, she was singing in her normal Janet Jackson voice. And she was like, sitting in the movie show. And we were like, no. Yeah, we said, I sing it low like you like you mess around. And then she was like, sitting in the movie show, like singing low. We had comped the vocal together. She heard it and she was like, wow. That attitude was the thing that we tried to bring out. But then the records she made up to that point were all these very kind of soft, pretty records. We were like, let's get that attitude back and let's give her tracks that are aggressive. That was kind of where the magic was. We trusted that whatever we threw at her, she could do. And she trusted whatever she threw at us, we could do. When Morris decided to, to go his way, he pulled me into his lair and groomed me even more to write scripts with him, to create scenarios for videos. We were the first and we were, we were highly uh, successful, but nevertheless, it's almost like the more success you had, um, I don't really think it mattered because it was, it, at the end of the day, it's, it's somebody else's thing. But even though you're having success, it never really feels like that's why it's still to this day feels weird when people go, man, I love you guys, you guys this and your music this and I just, and cool and I'm going like, uh, yeah, that's not me, that's not, that's Prince. I had already threatened to leave. I wanted to produce my own record and write for myself. He had uh, Cavallo come up to my place in Santa Monica. Morris, he never wanted it. He said, so I talked to Prince about this and Prince said, that's fine. And I said, yeah, that's what I want. You know, we talked it through and he said, as long as he can be the executive producer. I knew what that meant. That meant the same different day. I get it. It's time for me to move on. Probably because he might have been ensnared with the drugs and stuff. But when after Purple Rain, we had all this success and Prince wasn't going to make any movies connected. I said, I got a great idea for you guys. Purple Rain 2, the further adventures of the time. Cut back to the nightclub where some mob guys are in this audience and, and Morris and them win the second prize, which is a month in Vegas. They go to Vegas. They, their only friends are the showgirls, but the cops and the mob, both of them are after them. And I tell that to Morris. I say, you were going to have a monster home run. You're a star. You, that movie made you a star. I said, you made me a clown. Wow. Yeah. It, it... Oh, he was vicious. When the record was done, when the control record was done, John McLean, who was the A&R, head of A&R for A&M Records, he comes to Minneapolis. We play him Control. We play him Nasty. We play him Pleasure Principle. We play him Let's Wait a While. We play him Funny How Time Flies. Like, we're playing all these hits, right? Or we think they're hits. Well, he goes, I just need one more. We said, what are you talking about? He said, I just need one more record. So anyway, we hopped in the car or grab a bite to eat. Terry puts a cassette in. He goes, what's this? And he goes, wait, that's the one I need for Janet right there. That's the one. And we, what are you talking about, John? He said, that's the one I need for Janet. Play it for her. And if she likes it, she can have it. We just put the song on. And Janet's just sitting on the couch waiting to come in the room. And she's, we put the song on and she's kind of there and bobbing her head. And then she kind of walks in. She kind of leans on the door and she points at us. The song goes off. She goes, who's that for? And we said, you, if you want it. Oh, we said, he said, I got an advanced copy of Control by Janet Jackson. Right there, and Jimmy sent one over. He listened to it. He didn't think he heard one single on the record. He said, I threw that CD in the garbage. He said, every time I heard a song off that record, 
I'd hear the sound of that CD hitting the side of the tin can. I've always been the uh, type of person that danced to the beat of my own drums. You know what I mean? I took it as an insult. Yeah, because he, he came by, he drove by my house right after the Control album came out. And uh, he like threw the CD out the window or did something. Yeah. My mom told me. My mom would always say, you know, when people do that, it means that they really, they're jealous of you for something. Oh, how the hell is Prince jealous of me? That dude is the most talented dude ever in the history of people, period. I, I'm nowhere near him. Every time he heard one of those songs, it was like a reminder that like you were dead wrong. Yeah, I tend to like the things that I grew up with more so than what I'm getting and hearing amongst um, musicians today. I went and made it on my own merits. I wrote every song I ever did. Or every song was mine because if I would have even attempted to steal something, because he didn't, you know, he didn't play that. He would sue the pants off you because he had the bread to do that. Mm -hmm. So I never went into anything like that with him. And I had just never signed releases or something. So when I left, lawyers were telling me, man, he owes you millions of dollars and mm -hmm. you can go. And I never did. There's prices that myself and Morris had to pay if we were leaving. But I was never on a contract, but we still, there was prices you had to pay. You had to Different. give up some things. From uh, uh, deal you a reality check. And then there was the family. I knew what type of pressure he was under with his obligations to make sure that everybody had a place to work. He felt a responsibility to keep the train moving. Originally, Eric was here to be part of the family. An R&B band, but having the lead singers be white kids. That project had started before the Purple Rain tour. The time broke up. i never forget the day Jesse left. Morris had split. Morris walked out. Morris left. Morris is gone. Yeah. Prince was determined to pick up where the time left off. He got all the rest of us together with Jesse, the rest of the time together. He said, this is how it's going to go down. We're going to put Paul up front. You know, he pointed at me and I said, come on, you're kidding me. He said, no, you're going to be the next lead singer. And I, I couldn't believe it. Of course, I said, okay. <laughs> and see right there, that's a deal breaker for Jesse right there. Jesse's yeah. gone. That's a deal breaker. Jesse's like, dude, I'm out of here. I'm not doing that. They want out. No one wants to be yeah. there. Really contentious. I just left. I'm on my own. I had already lied my way into the record deal. They said, you you don't know about this. You, you produce records. Oh, yeah. I mean, of course. Man, I know what I'm doing. Ain't that a clue? <laughs> After Jesse left, he said, it's me, Jerome, and Paul, because that's all that was left. He said, that's okay, then. He said, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to make a new band. We're going to call it The Family. Yeah, there was Paul. There was Bean. But Bean and I were in the thick of the whole disbanding of the time. Exactly, exactly. My friends were gone. I missed them. Three of my friends helped make this band be what it was were gone, you know. But you were coming at it from a different angle because you were involved with them. Myself, you know, like Eric. I was not a fan of Prince's music. Who were in the peripheral. First time I ever saw a Prince performance was in the movie Purple Rain. And during this time, he was engaged to Susanna. We started getting very, very close. And he knew Susanna could sing. When we started recording the family record. And we didn't see the pre-planning, <laughs> right? I mean, we were there for the reveal. We didn't hear what was yeah, going on in his doing. mind. You weren't going to see that vulnerable side of him. His beloved time was breaking up, you know, his childhood with a part of himself. And that was disbanding and all of his brothers were leaving. <laughs> see, what it is is that the people around me in this world, I only have friends to bounce things off of, no matter what it is, if where a piece of clothing or whatever you do it's that's all you have they drove prince after you know after they left they was writing hits my best friend and business partner mr terry lewis they were taking space on the charts spaces that he wasn't going to get they gave each artist their particular sound their version what they think he should sound like Why is prince couldn't do that you know prince you're going to make me know the prince did you he had a creative formula he wasn't the best in explaining what he wanted to do. When you start giving up your secrets, then your secrets get used. That's a fair way for him to think. And now, the Stereo Warehouse on the Gulf Freeway presents the audio video, Prince! A telephone answering machine. Prince! Just $49. Compact laser disc, $199. I sincerely want to make this deal to you. Car stereos just. The Stereo Warehouse, Gulf Freeway in Edsbrook. Any other deal is no big deal. First album fun was 125. You get maybe get to get 20 out of that.
it, and I had bought a board, but, Soundcraft 1600, but it was garbage. And when I started recording, it was like, oh, what I paid 9000 or something. Anyway, I took that back. I was panicking. I had to make something happen. So I knew Prince would sell that board. It was a Soundcraft B3. Great board. We did a lot on <laughs> T99, Vanity, all the Purple Rain time. We did a lot of great stuff on that board. I called him and he's like, yeah, yeah. He's doing dress rehearsals at the St. Paul Civic Center. And I go over there and I give him a check for 18000 You know, that's like $9 million to me. So I bought bought it, which was like killing me. He know how poor I am, but I walk in the room and I said, oh, you know, I want to get that board and the check. And Alan Leeds was in the room and, uh, and I said, you know, you should be the nicest people anybody ever met. And he goes, why do you say that? And I say, because everything you've ever dreamed of is happening for you in the way that you dreamt. The, the, the family definitely is a, a story. It was a particular character that he wanted me to play. My part in the time was a young David Bowie guy. My part in the family was a smooth movie star, a old school, classy, a funky dude. It's a whole plot to it and the record and the look and the sound and, and that whole bit. But I remember getting the cassettes delivered to my mom's house. I'm maybe 20 at that point. He was brilliant at picking out individuals to support the stories. He was creating an entity. And this is what the entity was supposed to sound like. I'd listen to the music, have to learn the parts, you know, verbatim. That, that was my job. I thought I was going to go and sing them and go home in an hour. Prince came up to us and said, they ain't got time for date night. Better call your girlfriends. We're going to be here all night. We're going to be here a long time. Many months of rehearsals, of making sure that the, the choreography was right. Prince was really involved with that, with the show, and Jerome would help with the steps. And Prince wasn't there for the vocal sessions. It was David Z. It was David's job to help me get the emotion, the sound quality, the all those things that Prince brought to the party. Just trying to get the whole branding of that band happening. And then we finally, you know, Prince would call these shows at First Avenue, and people would just show up, and the place was packed. He shipped me out to acting, singing, and dancing lessons in L.A. I'm sure that he wanted to take us on the road at some point, but, you know, he had other stuff going on. He was 20-something years old, and he was the patriarch of this organization. And that's a really weird role with a group of friends. Once he got rid of that and just started having people there, the new kind of family he created, they were on the payroll, not as close as the ones that we had at the very beginning. Prince started traveling separate from the band. That, for me, was hard. We knew the guy, but the professional persona was somebody who was pretty mysterious and very powerful and sort of a lone wolf. But we started getting so close that the lone wolf started going away. You know, I, I don't, um, I'm not a real social person. You know, I don't hang out a lot. You know, I have my friends, but... Money changes you. As much as you say it may not, you, you know, no, I'm not, no, you're not the same person you grew up when we were 18, 19 years old. You're not. Now you this, you know, you this corporate person, you've got all these employees working for you, you got all this money, you could buy your, your door around the world and stuff. And that can get to you. It can get to you in a negative way sometimes when it comes to your friends. Me and Jerome were the last two from the, you know, sort of sitting there. And we were the ones he clung really hard to. You tired too? and almost forced us to stay. Things just started from there. Jerome, do that little thing that you did there. Okay, I want you to come out here. I want you to do it every show. I want you to do that little step. Uh, teach those guys that step. So we went into rehearsals for that. Same thing. Eight, 10 hours a day for nine months. Rehearsing the family. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. We do one gig at First Avenue, and then he takes off with Susanna and Jerome to France to do on the Cherry Moon. So meanwhile, he leaves Paul here, you know, thinking that Paul's just gonna hang around and not, you know, not do anything and everything. But he was more making the movies and he was getting his head into other things. But the problem is we had a hit record with Screams of Passion. Paul's 18 years old with a hit record. He was this, you know, beautiful 18-year-old kid. He could look like David Boyd and could crew and could sing. Prince had sent him out to L.A. to put him through acting school, singing lessons. But the problem is he's not under contract with Prince. And he had Paul out there unchaperoned. Back in those days, if you weren't under contract, you were fair game. If you are an 18-year-old kid and somebody offers you $250,000, what are you going to do? That's a foolish question. Thing is, I got a phone call 
from A&M Records that said, come in, I want you to produce Janet Jackson's record. Come in and have a meeting with me. I'm like, all right. So I went down to uh, Charlie Chaplin's studio, the A&M. The gentleman's name was John McClain. He said, I'm not here to talk to you about Janet Jackson. I just want to get you in the door. I want to steal you away from Prince. I'm like, what? No, that ain't happening, bro. But then he started pointing things out. My head started turning, and I started thinking about these things. And, of course, he's flashing dollars in front of me, and I'm going, hmm. You know, all the while, these contract negotiations are going south. Prince. <laughs> the Prince found out it went, people were going crazy. The man was going to break up. Chris, to a, a point, was got, you know, called me. It was good. You need to get your boy. You know, just like when Terry and Jimmy missed the flight. What, where were your boys? You need to talk to them. You know, always, it fell back on me, you know. And I, I talked to Paul, but like I said, that's 250. That, that's life changing. That's life changing for an 18 year old kid, you know. Yeah, oh boy. That was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. Whether it was right or wrong, I guess we'll uh, we'll never know. But it, I called him in France and just said, you know, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. He's, you know, of course he was upset. And, uh, you know, I just called him out there and he just said, well, if that's what you're going to do, see ya. Got to remember, I'm a 20-year-old kid mm -hmm. and all this stuff is going on with me. And this is possibly the greatest opportunity I'd ever have to do my own music. I ended up leaving the band and I ended up not even signing with the and I signed with MCA. I mean, my family went, what in the hell are you doing? But they stood behind me, but they, they were like, are you sure you want to open this can of worms? And I was like, I think I do. And that's when the fight broke out. I recall talking with Eric and Shelly Bean and, and uh, Susanna. And Paul was like, being, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, I hate to do this to you. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to take the deal. And that's what he did. So Prince had a fit. And he, Paul was Paul punking the month all around the country there for a while. As you know, if you saw Prince in concert during that time, he was. Because I knew it was coming. You know, it was not going to be a lot of fun. And it was not a lot of fun for. He didn't make it fun for a long time. And I regret the way that that was done. He had a song called. You know, he would take high fashion and call Paul, Paul Punk of the Month or whatever. But, you know, my whole thing is Paul did what he had to do. And these opportunities were presented to me that I had to look at. My representation at the time chose to leave in a way that I wouldn't do now that I'm a grown man. It wasn't as respectful as I'd like it to have been. Uh, it was basically, bye, mm -hmm. see you later. I got no contract and goodbye. I tried to tell Paul, I said, baby bro, I said, you know, just stay for the, this one. Just stay for this record. Say so we go out and tour. After that, you can do whatever the hell you want. You know, you go out and just make this as big as we can, and then you just tell Prince, like, dude, I, I'm gone. You know, because then the offers probably would have been bigger. They weren't happy that I was leaving by any means. I remember being saying, you, "Baby, bro, you got to do what you want to do. We'll be all right." Uh, Prince is in these. This is for the family's falling apart. Screams of passions on radio is like number nine. Whatever. He calls me from Europe and he asked me. He said, "Jellybean." I said, "Hey, Prince, what's up? I want you to join the revolution." And I said, "Oh, I said, okay, that's cool." I said, "But well, what are we gonna do about the family?" He hung up. About a week later, my check was cut in half. Mind you, I had just bought a house that he had given me the ten thousand dollar payment for. I just and now he's cut my check in half. There's no way I'm gonna be able to make these mortgage payments with my salary cut in half. I had to do some soul searching with that. Turned out, Terry and Jimmy was starting flight time. And so they put me on salary over there. So the little salary I got from him, from, from them, and the little salary I got from Prince, paid my mortgage until I could get on my damn feet. He was still over there. He was still over there. And then he came back, and then he fired me all the way after a while. He got the phone call. Hey, Jeff, hey, I can't afford you no more. Had his Fred Moultrie was the accountant. And hey, Prince said he can't afford you no more. And I said, like, okay, whatever. And I just hung up the phone I, I, at, at, by that point, you know, because he had been calling me, his bodyguard, uh, Gilbert, you know, who's Sheila's manager. He would call me and be like, Bean, I'm so sorry, man. I, he's tripping and everything. And I said, you know, we'll let him trip. You know, there's nothing I can do about it. I just got to get better at what I'm doing and make some money. And that's what I did. You know, production-wise, I started making money. I did make conditions for record. I did the audition. I did Alexander O'Neill. I did Nona Hendrix, you know, and I, I just started – you know, I got in the writer mode. I got in a very creative time in my life. And he can pull that out of you just from the bitterness of dealing with him. He can pull it. He can make you flat. That's what happened with Terry and Jimmy. He turned a lot of his relationships into transaction relations. They all became transactional. It changes your dynamic. You're the one in the band. You're all friends. But then you're writing the checks. And you've got other people telling you you're paying this one too much. And then there's this one. It's a really big adjustment. Yeah. And I think it took... Prince down a lonely road.